All right, guys, welcome back. We are continuing our conversation about the substance-related and addictive disorders for this module, and we are now at the substance use disorder section of this chapter. So a little review from our last uh, video lecture. Uh, the substance-related and addictive disorders are generally broken down into two broad categories, the substance-induced disorders and the substance use disorders. So we're talking about the substance-induced disorders. Those are disorders, small family of disorders, where we believe that, the, a sub, that, that substance use directly causes another mental health condition. Or maybe we also sometimes may use a diagnosis of withdrawal um, or intoxication if, if that applies to a client who we are evaluating. All of those are examples that we call in sub, substance-induced disorders. The substance use disorders is the larger of the two categories. And this is where we have a situation where a person could be a child, a teenager, or an adult. And what they exhibit to us is a problem with substance use. Substance use disorders, they are what they say they are. This is a new term. It's a new umbrella term that we use in the DSM um, that takes away other terms. In the old DSM-4, the DSM edition that we used prior to this purple book, there, in this section, there was something called substance abuse. It was an actual diagnosis, substance abuse. There was also something called substance dependence or addiction, and those were actual diagnoses. And the DSM-5, they have shifted away, sort of like we did, we saw with specific phobias. You know, the term specific phobia, we talk about anxiety disorders. We talk about how that is a broad umbrella diagnosis to kind of keep it simple for us. There's thousands of different phobias out there in our world today. But when we actually diagnose somebody with a phobia, we just call it a specific phobia. Well, kind of the same idea here with drug and alcohol problems. The umbrella term is this term, substance use disorder. That is this broad term that sort of underneath it falls many, many, many different kinds of problems with many, many, many different kinds of substances. The DSM says a substance use disorder is a cluster of cognitive and behavioral and physiological symptoms that indicate that an individual has continued to use a substance repeatedly despite direct substance-related problems. And so just this idea of it's a drug and alcohol, we would say a drug and alcohol problem. We could, we could also use the term addiction if we wanted to, but you don't find those terms. You don't find the term addiction. You don't find the term substance abuse or the term substance dependence in this section of the DSM. Instead, what we have is we have substance use disorder. So this is a drug and alcohol problem diagnosis. So there's two things I want to kind of highlight for you as far as how the DSM kind of organizes this section. It's not super confusing, but I want to make sure that you sort of understand it. Number one, the DSM provides for us uh, specific classes of substances and information about nine of them, nine substance classes. And it gives us specific information about nine different, nine of them. Alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, the hallucinogens, inhalants, opioids, the sedative hypnotics, the stimulants, and tobacco. So each of those nine drug classes has its own kind of section in the DSM-5. Where, for example, I'm just going to use alcohol. They, they go alphabetically. The DSM organizes them alphabetically. So alcohol's first. Starts with A. So on page 490 starts what is, what is called the discussion of the alcohol-related disorders. And the caffeine-related, then cannabis-related, then hallucinogen-related. So let me just talk for just a little bit about what is, so what is contained in the section of the DSM on page, for example, 490 in the big purple book. What is contained in the alcohol-related disorders? Well, a lot of great specific information related to alcohol abuse and alcohol use and an alcohol use disorder when someone's substance use disorder is around the substance of alcohol. It gives information about uh, course and development and history and treatment, a little bit of comorbidity. And so it gives all kinds of good information about alcohol. And then it talks about caffeine and it talks about cannabis and talks about the hallucinogens and then the inhalants. It takes them alphabetically and it gives all kinds of good information about these nine sp uh, substance specific classes that again, maybe you've already learned about it in some of your other drug and alcohol counseling classes. So that's one thing the DSM gives us, is it gives us these specific drug classes, and it gives us kind of unique information related to each one, which is really, really helpful when you and I are doing assessments of people with substance abuse problems, because one of the things we often have to find out is what substances are they using or abusing? Oftentimes there's more than one. Sometimes there's just one, one type. But that's, a, that, that's an important part of an assessment is, well, what has a person been using? What are they using? 
what is their drug of choice? What is their substance of choice, right? And so the DSM kind of gives us some, some, some substance-specific information about these nine different classes. And under each one, you have alcohol use disorder. Um, you have cannabis use disorder. Um, you have inhalant use disorder, opioid use disorder, all these different use disorders that kind of are specific to these nine different substance classes. And so that's, so that's, so that's one thing to highlight when you look at the substance use disorders. But the main thing it gives us is it gives us these 11 core symptoms. Because again, the DSM-5, just like it does with all these mental health conditions, it really is a book that, I, that highlights for us and breaks down for us what are the core possible symptoms you and I would evaluate and assess for. And there are 11 uh, that, that I want you to sort of just be familiar with. And kind, of, and kind of an easy way to kind of remember these 11 is that they are divided across four different categories. So for example, the first four of the 11 are what we call impaired control symptoms. And again, some of these you've heard, some of these types of symptoms you've heard before. So when would I, when would I know that someone's alcohol use or they're drinking or someone's marijuana use or someone's, uh, someone takes a pain pill or a sleeping pill or whatever it may be? When would I know that that, when, when would I know that that, 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 that behavior or, the, or that, that substance taking becomes a substance use disorder. Well, here are the kinds of things that we see where we get concerned. And, and the first thing is what we call impaired control. When people begin to lose or have a lack of control over their substance use, that's one of the things we get concerned about. And there are four different ways that could look. So for example, a person may, for example, as you're evaluating them, may report to you that they have been taking larger amounts of the substance as time has gone forward, or that their use of the substance has gone on longer than they intended. Or for example, they've, they, they've, they've had a lot of unsuccessful attempts to cut down or stop or control their use. Um, or you may realize, a person may, for example, you may realize that, that they have begun to increase their amount of time directly related to the obtaining of, the use of, or the recovery from the use of the substance. So we oftentimes say that their life begins to kind of revolve around the substance use. Um, the person begins to have persistent craving um, or a desire or an urge to use. Um, one of the things I was taught a long time ago in drug and alcohol counseling uh, and assessment was to ask clients, hey, even when you're not using, are you thinking about using? Are you planning to use? Even when, so, so if you only get drunk on the weekend or get drunk at night after work, what about when you're at work? Do you find yourself thinking about when you can get off and go use again? And that's an aside, so that, that, that's one of the core symptoms of an, of an addiction. And here, the, the, the DSM would call it, it's an impaired control symptom, where a person has this persistent craving or desire or urge to use, even when they're not using, even when they know they shouldn't, even when they've told someone they won't, even when the doctor has told them that they need to stop, there's still that urge and desire. So there's four there. That's four of the uh, first four of the 11, the impaired control symptoms. And then the next three are what we call social disruption and impairment symptoms. So in addition to impaired control kinds of things we would look, look for, we would also look for substance use disorders characterized by social disruption and impairment. So for example, uh, because of someone's substance use, have, has there been recurrent failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, at home, at school? Um, has the person continued to use even though they know that their use makes things worse in their life overall? They've lost relationships. They've lost jobs. They've had a doctor who has said, hey, if you don't stop smoking, you're just going to get sicker and sicker. And they know that smoking is making them sicker, but yet they continue um, to do it. Um, another thing we see sometimes too, sort of like with depression, you know, when people battle depression and they have that anhedonia kind of symptom, they start pulling back and kind of reducing their activities. Well, people who struggle with substance use disorders also do the same thing. Sometimes what we see is that they begin to pull back and reduce their social circle with only people who use just their drinking buddies, for example. Used to be active over here, used to go, my, go to my kid's baseball game, now I don't anymore. So do we, see, do we see their pattern of behavior, their social, recreational kinds of activities are, be, are beginning to be reduced and negatively, negatively affected by their substance use. So those are the social disruption and impairment symptoms. And then the next two are what we call risky use symptoms. So th that would be, for example, does a person continue to use or have they used in, phys in, in situations that we would consider physically hazardous? Have they ever, or do they continually drive while they're impaired? Do they go to work while they're impaired and therefore impair other people? Do they get high at home when they're supposed to be caring for their kids? They have a small baby at home who depends on them, but they're high all the time. 
So they're putting the, they're putting their baby at risk. So that, that so there's repeated use in situations in where it's considered physically um, hazardous. Also, too, do they continue to use again, even though they know that they're experiencing negative symptoms? Uh, physical, physiological, emotional, behavioral relationships, these risky use. And again, really with risky use, it's more the medical. So for example, the easiest example is kind of smoking, but not just smoking. It could also be alcohol. It could really be any of the substances that we talked about just a minute ago, where, where for example, a medical professional has said, hey, listen, this is killing you. Hey, listen, this is making your diabetes worse. Hey, listen, this is, I mean, this is making your asthma worse. I mean, you're going to have to be, you're going to be on oxygen soon. You're going to be on a ventilator if you don't stop you know, whatever. And people continue to use putting their health at risk. That would be another example of a risky use symptom. And then the last two, symptom 10 and 11, are patterns of either of tolerance and or withdrawal. So tolerance is a term you're familiar with. So this idea of tolerance is the idea that many substances of abuse, our body begins to build up physiologically a tolerance to them to where we have to take more of the substance to receive the same or desired effect because our body builds up a tolerance. So we have to continue using more and more and more. Whereas before, when I first started drinking, you know, I, I would kind of feel a little tipsy or a little lightheaded after a certain number of beers. But now that I've been drinking pretty consistently for a couple of years, man, I can drink a 12 pack. And once I get past 12, once I get past 12 and a 13, 14, then I start to feel so you see this increased use, but also too, physiologically, emotionally, psychologically, there is a reduced effect using the same amount of a substance. So my body is built up a tolerance, so I need more and more and more. So that's the first one. Then there's withdrawal. Now here's the key thing. Part of why I mentioned to you those nine uh, substance-specific classes earlier is, they, is the DSM gives us really, really good information about what withdrawal symptoms look like for the individual substances, because that can be a little bit different. Maybe some, maybe you learned some of that in your pharmacology, your counseling, I'll call another drug class. The idea that, that certain substances have different withdrawal patterns and, and profiles. So withdrawal is another potential pharmacological uh, symptom that we see. These last two are pharmacological symptoms. Um, so withdrawal is where uh, we see as when a person either stops using or cuts back. They try to cease or cut back, or they just stop their use. Um, we then people then can begin to experience withdrawal symptoms. Now again, we could have an entire class just on possible withdrawal symptoms, but a withdrawal symptom is a negative and or painful, emotional, psychological, cognitive, or physical symptom. We think about withdrawal being oftentimes more of a physical symptom, but also too a withdrawal. Some some drugs and alcohol, some substances. The withdrawal symptoms can be cognitive, racing thoughts, paranoid thoughts. Uh, it can also be, it can also be um, more emotional. People feel pain. They feel hurt. They may feel a little bit depressed. And then all the physiological symptoms as well, too. And so withdrawal symptoms. So one of the ways I like to kind of look at it this way is if you were out there working today and you were wanting to do a full, thorough assessment of someone's substance use, here are 11 things, like 11 questions. And there really are more than 11. But here, like, here's, like, here's like a good starting point. If you wanted to really evaluate you know, someone's substance use, here are 11 good questions that you could kind of ask someone around. And a lot of times, and many drug and alcohol treatment programs have questions like these, and especially if they're using the DSM-5, they, they, they may have even actually created an assessment tool based on these 11 kind of symptoms or these 11 kind of questions. So the bottom line is, it's just kind of yes or no kind of questions. Has the person ever, is the person presently, you know, those kinds of things. So those 11 symptoms spread out across four different categories, the impaired control symptoms, the social disruption and impairment symptoms, the risky use symptoms, and the pharmacological symptoms. Those are the, that, that, that's how the DSM identifies and organizes these substance use disorders. Now here's the also thing I wanna to mention to you before we move on to something else. The issue of symptom level of severity and symptom severity is really, really important. So one of the things you'll see in the DSM and I also have in your lecture notes is this. Uh, at the end of an assessment, one of the things the DSM also allows us to do is before we say, hey, this person has a substance use disorder and it's alcohol use disorder, uh, what we can further do is we can count up the number of symptoms we have present from our assessment. So for example, imagine you were evaluating me and you went through and you asked me these 11 questions and maybe my wife or my girlfriend has brought me in because of my problem drinking and she's worried about my drinking. And so I come in for an evaluation, you're my counselor, you do a thorough evaluation of me psychologically, emotionally, mentally, physically, but a lot of it has to do with my alcohol use. And let's say that out, out of the 11 symptoms, 
I only answered basically yes to like three. There's not many, but still, that can be, I mean, again, three is more than zero. So uh, let's, say that, let's say that I said basically yeah to three, but no to the rest. Well, three out of 11 would mean that my substance use disorder is mild. So, it, so I, I, would, I might be diagnosed with or be given a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder because, the, the, again, the drug is alcohol for me. Alcohol use disorder, mild. Imagine as we were talking that as you went through my assessment, you asked me those 11 questions. Let's say I, let's say that basically I said yes, kind of to five of them. So a little bit more, not many more, but more than, you know, no to, a, no, no to a bunch of others, six or so, but yes to five. Well, four to five symptoms would be substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder in this case, moderate. So at least two, two or three symptoms, mild, four or five symptoms, moderate, six or more severe. And again, a lot of us who work in drug and alcohol counseling, you know, a lot of our clients, by the time they get to us, oftentimes, not always, but by the time they get to us, usually, often, they are exhibiting usually at least six. And so oftentimes what we see in drug and alcohol counseling when we use a DSM is we are often diagnosing severe. Alcohol use disorder, severe. Cannabis use disorder, severe. Um, hallucinogen use disorder, severe. Because as, because as, a, as a result of their substance use, they, they have multiple, six or more of these substance use disorder symptoms. So that's an important way to kind of understand the different idea of all these different substance use disorders is, again, understanding the, the, the substance-specific classes. There's nine of them that the DSM gives us to kind of draw from and pull from as we're doing an assessment. And again, it gets kind of complicated. We talk about this more in the co-occurring disorders class. Um, it gets kind of complicated because clients will come in and uh, they're poly substance users, meaning, meaning that they, they, uh, they smoke marijuana, they also abuse opioid pain medicine, and they also abuse alcohol. So that's like three. So three different substances from those nine classes. And so sometimes we have to pair those things out a little bit and try to understand um, how, how those three different substance classes are kind of interwoven with each other. But, the, but, but again, I like how the DSM breaks it down. These nine different classes gives us a good, it gives us a good overview of the different kinds of of substances of abuse that we sometimes see in drug and alcohol counseling. And so it starts there and then kind of from there, then we have these four categories and 11 symptoms total that highlight for us a substance use disorder. Again, is it always clear? Not always clear. Is there often overlap between symptoms? Yes. Does there, is there, is, can there be and is there variability between clients? Absolutely there can be. But again, as I've said before many times in this class, for substance use disorders, those 11 symptoms gives you a starting point, gives you somewhere to jump off, gives you a place to get going in your conversation with your clients to at least evaluate you know, their risky use. Are they engaging in risky use kind of thing? Do they have pharmacological symptoms? Is there a lack or impaired control? And has there been relationship, social relationship impairment because of their substance use? Substance use? Those four broad categories give us a great place to kind of get started. Okay, so... That's the end of this video. Come back. There's one more little mini video. We want to talk about process and behavioral addictions in the DSM real briefly. And now you've got substance-induced disorders and now substance use disorders. Come back for the non-substance-related disorder uh, addiction for the next video. And I'll see you next time.